Today on Creation.com Talk, we are discussing vestigial organs. I'm Dr. Robert Carter. I'm a speaker for Creation Ministries International. And I'm Dr. Jonathan Safadi, also a speaker for Creation Ministries International. Now, Jonathan and I have had a very interesting conversation already this morning as we're gearing up for this. So we're going to just kind of jump into the middle of the conversation as we discuss something that evolutionists have used for centuries now to try to just prove creation. But it's a very bad and very outdated argument that has some interesting modern manifestations, which are also bad. But we'll get to those in a little bit. Right. I mean, the idea is that uh, the human body and other creatures are filled with lots of useless or vestigial organs. And let's be very clear, for a long time, uh, the word vestigial was described as degenerate or atrophied, having become functionless in the course of evolution. Uh, For instance, the World Book Encyclopedia 2000 says vestigial organs are useless remains of organs that were once useful in an evolutionary ancestor. But Here's a question. How can you prove something doesn't have a function as opposed to a function we haven't discovered yet? Excellent question. So I guess the point here is evolutionists predicted the presence of basically uh, evolutionary experiments gone bad or useless evolutionary experiments, things that may have evolved once like in a fish. But now that we're people, we don't have any use for them anymore. So these remnants of old features should still be sticking around. Oh, that was the argument, and they once thought of about uh, 200 plus organs in the human body that uh, were useless, but I don't think anyone would believe that anymore. I heard an anatomist recently say that we've discovered so many functions for the human appendix that we don't know what the primary function is. Well, the appendix, I think, deserves uh, treatment on its own. I think one of the uh, things that was discovered in the last 10 years is how it's used as a safe house for good bacteria. And of course, that meant we had to realize that Uh, We have about as many bacterial cells as human cells, and most of them are good for us. But if you have an infection and your bowel was cleared, um, the bacteria cleared. So what the the appendix does is store those good bacteria to repopulate. uh, One function of many. So so what are some other classic vestigial organs? Uh, The tonsils. Okay, they're very important for the immune system in the throat. You don't just want to cut tonsils out anymore. Uh, What's another one? I mean, things like the thymus gland was thought to be vestigial, yes. uh, and yet we know it has a very important function. O- over and over again, these things which are supposedly useless, we've discovered what they actually do. Now, they thought the thymus was vestigial because it didn't have any ports or ducts, right? Yeah, the, then uh, the, the, that's why they're now called the endocrine glands. It means they have uh, their ductless gland- glands, but you know that they're incredibly important things. Yeah, just because it didn't have a direct connection to the bloodstream or something didn't mean it wasn't excreting hormones and other important chemicals. So it was really an argument from ignorance the whole time. And presumably, uh, the idea of vestigial organs was a science stopper because it stops people discovering what these things do. Yeah, so evolution here uh, actually hampered technological progress. Because once you decide the thing doesn't have a function, why would you want to study it? Huh, excellent point. Well, I mean, I think the only thing is, I would say there might be some what I call um, vestigial organs, but again, would that actually prove, um, disprove creation? Because we believe in creation followed by the fall. Uh, yes. While Darwin was attacking as if we believe the creation is still perfect, as opposed to it was created perfect and it's now degenerated. So our model would actually allow for vestigial organs, but we wouldn't necessarily find too many of them. If they actually existed. And there, there might be a few out there somewhere, but I can't actually off the top of my head think of one that's directly vestigial because as we look, we find more evidence for function of all these different features in all different types of animals. In fact, the, um, the presence of a function is the Achilles heel of vestigial organ theory because all you got to do is look for a function and the idea dies. And that's what happened over time. All these hundreds of things that were supposedly left over vestigials. Oh, that has a function, that has a function, that has a function, that has a function. But there's something else in the design argument also. To, To have a feature doesn't mean it has an extremely important function. I mean, the shape of the human ear is not critical. You know, some people have a widow's peak on their forehead and some people have a high hairline, especially as you get older like I do. It These things aren't incredibly important as far as their function goes. They can shape and change and move around Mm. and it's no big deal. And that's perfectly within the idea that God is the creator. So, 
it actually is a problem for the evolution because evolution would select for survival value, not necessarily for things that are nice to have but not essential to have. And yet we're actually loaded up with redundancies and with things that improve our life but are not essential, but evolution wouldn't have necessarily selected for those things. I mean, the only vestigial organ might be something like a blind fish, the, the uh, shriveled eyes of a fish in, in a cave. We would say, well, yeah, they actually did evolve from, well, not they devolved. They devolved from a uh, sighted fish. But again, that's going downhill. It's not going up. It's a, it's a creation. We have them in dark caves. So if you ha they have a mutation, destroys their eyes, it doesn't get selected against. And, and we see a lot of that in the genetics world and bacteria, where oh, okay. if you have a bacterium living in some environment, but there's another bacterium producing something this bacterium needs, well, it might lose the genes for producing that substance. It doesn't have to produce it. This other guy's making it. We see that, especially in the, um, in the ocean, mm -hmm. in different places in the ocean, the same species of bacteria might actually have different genes. Oh, well. Because if there's a complementary bacteria that's producing some chemical this first one needs, mm. and this gene breaks, it's completely irrelevant because it can still get it from the environment. This is a process of breaking if we're losing things. And so, yeah, there might be a vestigial gene there. Okay. Still fits within creationism beautifully. And it doesn't explain how the gene got there in the first place. And it seems that no, parasites are not. also a big example because you have the late Lynn Margulis saying that the, uh, the treponema that causes syphilis and the Borrelia that causes Lyme disease contain only about a fifth of the genes they need to live on their own. So it looks like you've got quite yep. a few things that have lost maybe 80% of their genes because the body they live in, the, para the thing they're parasitizing is supplying the things they need so the bacteria yeah. doesn't need it anymore because you've got um, human tissue providing all that, uh, the nutrients they need so they've degenerated compared to free living things which are not harmful to us. Yeah, so would we call the genome of syphilis vestigial? Now we're getting into a matter of semantics and mm -hmm. definitions. It's certainly it's, it's the same sort of principle of degeneration from something yeah, which is high. It's degenerated, you see, and we our model allows for degeneration, um, but what evolution needs is going the opposite direction, going uphill, finding new yeah. organs, not um, decayed organs, but finding something which is actually growing, becoming, becoming functional, not losing function. And that parallels a lot of what we see in the world of adaptation. All these evolutionists saying this thing is evolving and it's adapting to this new environment. And almost every single example for the last hundred whatever years mm -hmm. has been something that's broken. I guess so. Yeah, you yeah. can you can break a trait and you have a new trait, fine, but that doesn't explain where that original trait came from. It's just some mutation happened, sort of like the um, the sickle cell gene in humans. Right. If you carry that sickle cell gene you have a, a great advantage in the presence of malaria. You're much more likely to survive a malarial infection, but it's still a broken gene and is still a, a decaying product of the genome, and it's not good for you. It actually hurts to have sickle cell anemia. Well, it's, it's just yeah. better to be hurt than to be dead as far as reproduction is concerned. Well, apparently what happens is the, the, by, by, um, if you have heterozygous, you have one good gene and one sickle cell gene, the... the uh, parasite gets into a red blood cell and causes the the uh, thing to sickle, and then the spleen will eventually detect that and say, "That's a defective cell. I'm going to destroy it." And the parasite gets yeah. destroyed with it. So it's like blowing up a bridge in your country to defeat an invading army. Yep, you're killing the the, the invader, but you're also down a bridge. You see. Yep, it's the scorched earth policy of evolution, and that's what we see: scorched earth everywhere. We don't see anywhere brilliant genius creative acts happening in the world of evolution and so all these examples that darwin used and evolution's views since then they all argue in the wrong direction they actually argue in the direction of creation and away from the direction of evolution well that's a, a big point so what's the main thing now they seem to be using uh junk dna oh that's, that's my in my world of genetics junk dna is the modern vestigial organ argument this started in the 1950s mm. when J.B.S. Haldane and others, they realized mathematically they had a problem. And that is, if natural selection is going to drive the difference between humans and chimpanzees, it can't select for millions of differences at the same time. Mm. It can only do one or two at a time. And over maybe millions of years, you might be able to pick up a few hundred differences. Ooh. But there are millions of differences. And so in the 
late 60s and early 70s, junk DNA theory came out where once they realized that only about 2% of the genome coded for proteins, they said, oh, see that? The rest of the genome is just junk. It can mutate at random and natural selection only focuses on this little part that codes for proteins. And now we can explain the differences. So that's been undermined quite uh, considerably in the last um, decade or two, right? Absolutely destroyed. And yet evolution still hold on to it because if they get rid of the idea that most of the genome is vestigial, that is junk, then they have a mathematical problem. There are too many differences between humans and chimpanzees. Even if mm. we are, pick a number, 95% identical, depends on what you're counting, but let's just say 95%. If we're 95% identical, their math doesn't work. They need us to be 99% identical. Which is just if not we're as low as yeah. No, that's totally not true. If we're as low as 90% identical, which could quite possibly be true if you're counting everything, mm. there's no way they can account for the differences between humans and chimpanzees. So they're holding on to this idea of junk DNA as tight as they can, even mm -hmm. though it has been completely destroyed over the last couple of decades with science advancements. So this is another uh, junk DNA is a science stopper as well, because it's, again, hindered yeah. research in finding the functions of DNA. Well, what are some of these functions? Yeah. J.S. Maddock, uh, decades ago, said that junk DNA was the greatest mistake in history of molecular biology. And I believe you've recently pulled up a, a newer quote from him. Well, he's actually now, he was a, professor, a geneticist at the University of Queensland in Australia. Now he's a okay. CEO of Genomics England. And in his profile page on that site, he said, I think my most important professional achievement has been to be the first to recognize that the human genome is not largely junk, but rather that the 98.5% that doesn't code for protein specifies a massive hidden layer of regulatory RNAs that organize Ooh. our development and provides a platform for brain function. This explains many mysteries, including the fact that the human genome contains the same number, 20,000, and largely the same repertoire of conventional protein coding genes as simple nematode worms with only a hundred with only a thousand cells. So the information that, human, that produces a human must lie elsewhere. So that's uh, what, what the junk DNA does. It tells us the difference between um, nematodes and humans. So it's simply yeah. doing something. And yet uh, the idea of junk DNA um, was a science stopper in hindering discovery of these important functions. Yeah, we now know that the genome, even though only a little bit of it codes for protein, most of the rest of the genome has very important functions controlling which genes are expressed, which proteins are made, what version of which proteins mm. are made, in which cell type, at different stages of development. It's like if our genome was a computer, the DNA would be the ROM, the mm. operating system written down that can't be changed. And then the RNA is the RAM. Hmm. That's where all of the decisions are made. That's where all the calculations are being done. So the RNA world is huge. Your cells produce a massive amount of RNA from the so-called junk DNA. And that all that RNA is making decisions on which proteins to manufacture. That's incredibly complicated and completely opposite of junk DNA theory. Well, the fact that it's actually it is being transcribed to RNA shows it's doing something, um, and yeah. we have to still work out what a lot of it's doing, but it's still doing yeah. something. I um, mean, it's not inert stuff that clogs us up, clogs up the, the genome, obviously. On the other hand, mm -hmm. from a design perspective, there still could be parasitic RNA. Mm -hmm. There could be parts of the genome that aren't supposed to be transcribed, and they are, and, and the genome is actually where the cell is wasting energy mm -hmm. by making this because something broke. It wasn't supposed to be doing that way, and now it is. That's still, that's right there within creationism. We can have parasitic RNA. We can also have a lot of non-functional RNA or mm -hmm. non-functional DNA, DNA that really doesn't do anything except it's scaffolding. It holds the, the genes in a three-dimensional shape so that mm. they can be used properly. So yeah, you might be able to delete a piece of DNA and it might not kill the cell. Okay. In fact, you might be able to delete a lot of DNA, just like if you took a house and you started knocking out bricks, you could probably like, you know, a giant Jenga thing. You can mm. pull the things out and a lot of them aren't perfectly, absolutely 100% necessary, mm. but eventually you'll pull one out and the whole thing will collapse. And that goes presumably back to what, what natural selection would select would be the minimalist thing, only what's enough yeah. to survive and 
reproduce and not all these other things which seem to be superfluous. So why would they be there under an evolutionary theory? I just wonder. Excellent point. Excellent. The complexity and the extra design we see in life is a very strong argument for creation. Evolution would never do that. Cool. Yeah, so I guess the, the creation followed by the fall model, which is the biblical model, is the way that explains both the, the amazing complexity, but sometimes the degeneration that we see as well. Yeah, so both things fit in the creation model. And therefore, vestigial organs are not at all a challenge for creation. The lack of vestigial organs is a challenge for evolution. The presence of a couple, perhaps vestigial things in, in the realm of life actually fits in with the idea that we, that all life actually is degenerating over time. Well, to sum up then, uh, vestigial organs fit very well with the biblical creation fall model. They don't fit well with the evolutionary model. Um, in fact, vestigial organs have been a science stopper. They've killed science. They've actually stopped people finding out important functions of organs and the so-called junk DNA, which belongs in the junk pile. It's so discredited. Um, so if you want to know more about us, please look at the resources below, uh, below the, the video. And we can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, uh, on Parler if it ever gets back. Um, and of course, <laughs> creation.com, our main website. So we look forward to seeing you in future uh, podcasts.